Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Nokia's fourth quarter 2023 results call. I'm David Mulholland, head of Nokia Investor Relations, and today with me is Pekka Lundmark, our president and CEO, <coughs> along with Marco Varen, our CFO. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer. During this call, we will be making forward-looking statements regarding our future business and financial performance, and these statements are predictions that involve risks and uncertainties. Actual results may therefore differ materially from the results we currently expect. Factors that could cause such differences can be both external as well as internal operating factors. We have identified such risks in the risk factor section of our annual report on Form 20F, which is available on our Investor Relations website. Within today's presentation, references to growth rates will mostly be on a constant currency growth rate basis, and where we refer to margins, it will be based on our comparable reporting. Please note that our Q4 report and a presentation that accompanies this call are published on our website. The report includes both reported and comparable financial results and a reconciliation between the two. With that complete, in terms of the agenda for today, Pekka will give an overview on the quarter, and then Marco will go into a bit more detail on some of the key factors impacting our financial performance before Pekka gives a brief conclusion and we move to Q&A. With that, let me hand over to Pekka. Thank you, David, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. So let me start with an update of some of the strategic and operational changes we announced with our Q3 results in October. We are evolving our operational model to give our business groups increased autonomy and have now embedded our sales teams into the business groups. This announcement has been well received by our customers. We have hit the ground running in 2024. The move to embed sales teams into the business groups happened at the start of the year. We have appointed customer account executives and the country manager role has also been reinforced. The customer account executives are there to ensure that we still offer one point of contact and person responsible for overall relationship management with customers without detracting from the accountability of the business groups. Some corporate functions have also moved to the business groups as we move to a leaner corporate center. During first half of 2024, we will begin reporting business group regional sales and cash flow metrics to further enhance transparency. And we already commenced the process of resetting our cost base during 2023. We expect this program will generate 400 million euro of gross savings during 2024. If we then turn to Q4 and uh, 2023 full year, we, of course, saw a meaningful shift in customer behavior impacting our industry. This was driven by macroeconomic environment and high interest rates along with customer inventory digestion, especially in North America. This led to our fourth quarter sales declined by 21% and full year sales declined by 8% in constant currency. Proactive action across our organization meant we were able to protect our profitability while continuing to invest in R&D, and we delivered a comparable operating margin of 14.8% in Q4 and 10.7% for the full year. This was a resilient performance considering the challenging environment and lower contribution from our high-margin patent licensing business as some renewals remained outstanding. We were pleased with our cash performance in the quarter where we generated 1.7 billion euro of free cash flow and we ended the year with a net cash balance of 4.3 billion euro. Positively, we also ended the year with improving order intake. Our fourth quarter book to bill was above one, particularly supported by our network infrastructure business, indicating at least some improvement in the overall spending environment. Moving on to network infrastructure, uh, sales declined by 24% in constant currency versus the year ago quarter, which had been particularly strong. For the full year, sales declined by 9%, mainly driven by IP and fixed networks. Optical networks grew by 5% and ASN declined slightly. There was a favorable development in cross margin, which impacted by improved by 60 basis points versus the year ago quarter and by 130 basis points for the full year, and this was driven by positive product mix. Operating margin in the quarter decreased to 13.9% due to the impact of lower sales. 
for the year, our margin ended up at 13.1%, which was comfortably within the range we had shared at the beginning of the year and above the targets we had set for ourselves back uh, in 2021. As you remember, we had Capital Markets Day back then when we, where we set the targets for each of the businesses, business in 2023. Also, if I can give you a quick update on the profitability of each of the units within NI for the full year 2023, IP Network saw its profitability decline slightly due to the weaker sales coverage, but remains mid to high teams of any margin. Optical networks improved strongly benefiting from the sales growth to deliver a high single digit of any margin. For fixed networks, despite the sales decline, product mix was beneficial and delivered high teams operating margin. And finally, summary networks remained low single digit, but did improve slightly year over year. Mobile networks Q4 saw the continued impact of normalization of India rollout and the dual impact of inventory digestion and macroeconomic pressure on spending in North America. We were, however, pleased to see a robust gross margin performance supported by favorable regional and product mix in Q4. Similarly, operating margin for the quarter was 11.5%, an improvement of 470 basis points versus the year ago quarter, driven by gross margin and lower variable pay accruals. For the full year, in spite of top-line challenges, operating margin was 7.4%, which was within our stated planning assumption for the year and at the higher end of our targets we set back in 2021. Finally, on mobile networks, <coughs> AT&T's recent announcement to move to a largely single-sourced radio network was, of course, a disappointing development. As we said at our investor event in December, and as confirmed by AT&T, this does not reflect the technological competitiveness that we have achieved with our products. This has been evidenced by our significant increase in RAN market share in recent years. I firmly believe mobile networks has the right strategy in place to create value for our shareholders in the future with opportunities to gain share, diversify our business, and achieve a double-digit operating margin longer term. CNS sales declined in Q4 by 5% driven by declines in all businesses with the exception of business applications, which grew. Gross margin improved, and this flowed through to operating margin, and the full year improved from 5.3% to 7.9%. The 7.9% operating margin we delivered is at the higher end of what we targeted at the start of the year. It is slightly below the lower end of what we had set as target back in 2021. This is due to the increased investments we decided to make in private wireless, which has been consistently delivering double-digit growth. 2023 did see us making progress in our portfolio rebalancing efforts with the divestment of Vital QIP, the announced sale of our device management and service management platforms businesses in December, and the partnership we announced with Red Hat, Red Hat on cloud infrastructure. We also led the industry trend towards programmable networks with the launch of our Network as Code platform, which now has nine commercial agreements. Nokia Technologies net sales decreased 63% on both the reported and constant currency basis in the fourth quarter, as the year ago quarter had a 305 million one-off non-cash benefit we explained at the time. Excluding this, the year-on-year -year net sales performance primarily reflected lower net sales from a license that expired at the end of the third quarter 2023. The financial performance in 23 was, of course, not what we had hoped for, as some deals took longer to renew than what we had, than we had ex expected. There were still some very important there were still some very important achievements. We signed long-term renewals with both Apple and Samsung, along with signing a new agreement with Honor. Positively, as we, of course, announced yesterday, we have now achieved a renewal with Oppo, and we are very close to concluding another agreement in China. With these agreements, we are now in the final stages of our smartphone license renewal cycle with only the recently expired major agreement outstanding. 
This provides long-term stability to our Nokia Technologies business, which can now increasingly focus on growing our licensing run rate in the new growth areas, including automotive, consumer electronics, IoT, and multimedia. I remain confident that with uh, growth in these areas, we can return to an annual net sales run rate of 1.4 to 1.5 billion in Nokia Technologies in the midterm. Enterprise net sales decreased 3% in constant currency in Q4 in comparison to a very strong year ago quarter. However, for the full year, we grew 16%, which shows strong continued momentum. Overall customer engagement also remains strong as we added 151 new enterprise customers in the quarter. Private wireless continued to show strong growth in 2023 and now has more than 710 customers. You can also see on the right-hand side of this slide a breakdown of the 2.3 billion euro of enterprise sales we had in 2023. We wanted to give a bit more color around the components of our enterprise business. Almost half of our enterprise sales come from areas where we sell our NI products into targeted enterprise verticals, particularly those that value mission-critical networks. Private wireless is now just over a quarter of our enterprise sales, having grown strongly for several years. And then web scale is an increasingly important opportunity for us as well. Now I will hand over to Marco to go through the financials in more detail. Thank you, Petka, and uh, good morning, good afternoon from my side as well. And let's start by looking at the regional performance of the businesses. And uh, in quarter four, all regions declined, uh, and um, uh, we saw growth uh, in Middle East and Africa. Most notably, North America declined once again and reflected the inventory digestion and macro uncertainty which has been dominating most of the year. India declined by 30%, uh, and uh, this was related to the 5G deployments that continue to normalize. And in Europe, we saw meaningful decline in the quarter, and, and um, uh, some of uh, which was driven by Nokia Technologies, which is entirely uh, reported in the Europe numbers. Otherwise, the decline was mainly driven by mobile networks and network infrastructure. And then looking at the operating profit in the quarter, Pekka explained a number of these drivers already, but a few things that I, I want to point out. And first one is group common contribution, which was better than a year ago quarter. And this was driven by venture fund where the performance improved. In mobile networks and cloud and network services, they improved somewhat year on year. And then, however, the majority of the decline was driven by Nokia Technologies, where the year ago quarter benefited from the 305 million one-off that Becca mentioned. And then moving to our cash position in quarter four, we had a strong quarter and ended the year with 4.3 billion of net cash, an increase of 1.3 billion uh, compared to quarter three. And this is mainly reflected strong quarter four profits and a significant inflow of cash related to net working capital. And this was due to both lower inventories as well as receivables, which benefited from a partial prepayment of license and agreement that was made in 23. And during quarter four, we returned over 200 million to shareholders through dividends and the completion of the second trans of our two-year 600 million share buyback program. In the full year 23, we returned over 900 million to shareholders through dividends and share buybacks. Free cash flow the full year uh, was just over 800 million, and this is 34% conversion compared to operating profit. And this was in line with our guidance of 20 to 50% for the year. Then turning to our 22, 24 cash flow outlook, we try to provide a view here on the moving parts in the uh, 30 to 60% free cash flow conversion from comparable operating profit 
that we have guided for. We do expect to see a positive impact from our operational and networking capital in 24, as we continue to see some reduction from the buildup we saw during the past two years. And then we expect cash taxes to be about 500 million in 24. And then we assume also cash flow related to restructuring uh, of about 550 million. Although I would like to note that we also target to achieve the 500 million in year cost savings in 24. And these related both the program we just launched, but also the final savings of our prior 21 program. And then finally, Nokia Technologies, we expect cash generation to be approximately 700 million below operating profit. And this is due to prepayments that we received in 23. But one from 25 and onwards, we expect greater alignment between Nokia Technologies, cash generation, and operating profit. So taking these into consideration, we should land into the 30 to 60 percent conversion rate. Then, as you look out to 26, you can see that we are well on track to reach our target of 55 to 85 conversion, especially as Nokia Technologies cash generation starts to align more with its, its operating profit. And then at the end of 23, our net cash represented about 19% of our net sales, which is above the target of 10 to 15% that we laid out in the beginning of the year. And given this strong cash position, the board of directors will propose an increase in our dividend to 13 cents per share. And the board is also proposing to initiate a new buyback program of 600 million over two years. And given the ongoing macroeconomic uncertainty and industry challenges, we feel it is prudent to take a measured approach to getting to the 10 to 15% net cash target. And if we now look at the 24, you can see in the presentation on the release the planning assumptions we have for our business groups in 2024. And as you can see, these are well aligned with the commentary we provided back in December. I will not go into detail on each number, but you will note that we provide a net sale assumption by business group instead of the targeted uh, addressable market assumptions we have provided in the past which we hope gives greater transparency as well. And piecing all of these assumptions together, you can understand our full year outlook for 24. We are now guiding for comparable operating profit between 2.3 and 2.9 billion, which takes into consideration all of the BG assumptions. We also expect the free cash flow conversion between 60, uh, 30 and 60 percent for the reasons I pulled through earlier. And one further planning assumption we have provided that I would like to highlight is around the seasonality that we expect in 24. We expect Q1 net sales in our network businesses to show a largely normal seasonal decline sequence. And since 2016, the average Q1 sequential decline in sales has been 23%. And we expect significant seasonality in profit generation in 24, with low sales coverage to weight on operating profit in quarter one, especially in MN and CNS. And then the company then expects progressive improvement in these businesses throughout the year. I also want to draw your attention to some changes that we will be making to disclosures and accounting for 2024. These changes are being made to enhance transparency and further support understanding of financials of our business groups. First, by quarter two at the latest, we start disclosing regional sales and cash flow metrics by business group. 
to help provide a more complete picture of the individual parts of the business. And the second is that we will um, change the way of account for the impact of our venture funds. Historically, they have been recorded in other operating income and expense, and therefore included in our operating profit. But going forward, we will now report these in financial income and expenses. And we believe that this makes sense given the volatility of these valuations in recent years. And with that, back to you, Pekka, for some final thoughts before Q&A. Thanks, Marco. And, and just very quickly, before we turn to Q&A, let me conclude with a couple of, couple of remarks. Uh, first of all, as already discussed, we faced a highly challenging environment in 23, but considering the 8% decline in net sales, I believe we delivered a pretty resilient financial performance. Our business group did a good job maintaining profitability and still delivering on operating margin targets, as we said at the start of the year. We also delivered a solid cash performance in line with the guidance we gave at the start of the year. This is enabling the board to propose an increase in our shareholder distributions for the coming year. Secondly, we are moving quickly on our cost reduction program, and more importantly, we continue to take steps to increase the operational autonomy of our business groups. We want to make sure they are empowered to take the right decisions to create shareholder value into the future. And finally, while the environment will remain challenging in the first half of 2024, the strong order intake we saw in Q4 points to some improvement in the spending environment, especially for network infrastructure. Also, we are now in the final stages of our smartphone license renewal cycle in Nokia Technologies. This will lead to greater stability in Nokia Technologies going forward and will allow the business to focus more on its growth areas. With that, I will hand back to David for the Q&A. Thank you, Pekka and Marco, for the presentations. The Q&A session, as a courtesy to others in the queue, please could you limit yourself to one question and a brief follow-up. Alice, with that, could you please give the instructions? We will now begin the question and answer session. If you are also viewing the video webcast, please remember to mute the audio on your computer before asking your question, as there is a 30-second delay. To ask a question, you may press start, then one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the key. To withdraw your question, please press start, then two. I will now hand the call back to Mr. David Moholden. <coughs> Thanks, Alice. We'll take our first question from Jacob Bluestone from BNP Paribas Exam. Jacob, please go ahead. Thanks, David. Hi, good morning. Um, I was hoping you could maybe expand a little bit on the, the green shoots commentary. Um, specifically, what do you think is driving the, the, the sort of improvement coming through? Um, and maybe if you could just comment a little bit whether you're seeing any green shoots in mobile networks or if it's just on the network infrastructure side. Thank you. Yes, thank you. The, um, the comment on green shoots was clearly more on the NI side. Uh, and of course, the good thing now is that, as you know, we have the four businesses in NI. We had uh, strong order intake in Q4 in all four business divisions of NI. Uh, in IP networks, uh, it's uh, driven by tailwinds in web scale uh, and enterprise contracts. In fixed networks, it's driven by government funding, uh, which starts to benefit the market uh, already now in order intake, but because of the delivery cycle, then in terms of sales and top line, mostly in the second half of 2024. In optical networks, it's simply uh, share gains because of our strong product momentum and the excellent feedback we are receiving from customers to our to our recent product announcements. And in, sub, in submarine networks, we already had a strong order book uh, in the beginning of the quarter, uh, but we had great order intake in Q4 as well, and, and, and that combination is now going to be driving the, the outlook for that business going forward. Did you have a follow-up, Jake? Maybe just on the mobile networks, what are you sort of seeing there? Um, it sounds like it's still pretty tough. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the market will remain tough at least for the first half uh, of the year. When you look at the mobile networks uh, uh, sales guidance for, for this year, there, of course, you need to 
remember that the significant part of that is driven by India. Uh, our group sales in India were, uh, in 2022, they were 1.3 billion euros, and last year 2.8 billion. And now we are uh, expecting that uh, 24 on group level would be somewhere between uh, one and a half to two billion euros. And most of that decline, most of that decline that we will see in India this year will be in mobile networks. So that already, when you do the math, you can see that that explains a significant part of part of the drop. But overall, I mean, we are still expecting or, or waiting waiting for mobile operators throughout the world to start investing because uh, investments have been very low. 23 was a tough year for the whole market, of course, most pronounced in North America. Fact still remains that only about 25% of base stations outside of China are, are 5G mid-band, and uh, a small majority of all core networks have been upgraded 5G advanced. Uh, and those investments will need to come because without that, operators will not be able to monetize 5G uh, uh, properly. Uh, right now, invest interest rates are still high. Many operators have high leverage. The good thing would be that in if interest rates would come down, uh, data traffic will continue to grow 20 to 30 percent per year. So gradually, that will also start to force operators to again uh, invest. But uh, the reality is that that uh, nobody knows when that will come. I'm absolutely convinced that it will come, but we are not yet seeing concrete signs of it happening. Thank you, Jacob. We'll take our next question from Simon Leopold from Raymond James. Simon, please go ahead. Great. Thank you for, for taking the question. I, I wanted to see if you could help us in terms of how uh, the, the AT&T transition with the, uh, the, the ORAN uh, project is affecting your, your revenue assumptions. And, and what I'm sort of trying to tease out here is, is there sort of a step down rapid decline or is there maybe a, a, a long tail of spending before it slow down? I, I just like a little bit of color about how we should think about that revenue impact uh, in 2024. Thank you. Okay. So uh, just as a reminder, we said that uh, AT&T represented last year 5 to 8% uh, of sales in, in mobile networks. So that it's important to keep in mind that that 23 number was significantly, in terms of uh, euros or dollars, uh, was significantly lower than in 21 or 22. So we had already seen a significant decline in AT&T volumes because of their lower uh, investments. Now, uh, we have an existing contract with a five-year contract with AT&T that, uh, that was published in the beginning of 21. Negotiations are still ongoing with respect to how we execute on this contract, and, uh, and uh, uh, before we have concluded those negotiations, it is hard to give a clear answer uh, as to the, how the trajectory of, of decline will uh, look like. But clearly, we do expect our sales to AT&T to drop this year. We have to remember, though, that, that when we first of all look at mobile networks, uh, irrespective of this contract, we will continue to supply microwave radios and femto products to AT&T. And then outside of mobile networks, we obviously continue to remain, we remain a key supplier in both network infrastructure and CNS. And those two businesses do not have anything to do with the, uh, with the radio network decision that AT&T made. Did you have a Yeah, and as a follow-up, uh, the, the forecasting this quarter in terms of the, the planning, we don't have a, a revenue outlook, but there is the, the operating income outlook. And I, I imagine that that is what's really important to, to folks. But I, I assume there is an underlying revenue assumption. Um, you would have given it to us, I imagine, if you wanted to, and you've chosen not to. So maybe help us understand sort of the thinking and the, the puts and takes on what assumptions you've made for full year 24 revenue um, and, and the choice to guide the way you have. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, uh, as you see, we, we changed a little bit how we're guiding for this year, and, and we decided to give more flavor and information about our assumptions for business growth. And um, uh, we believe that this will be more helpful for you to get a better picture of each of the businesses which are then combining the whole company and, and um, uh, for the group level we 
we guide on the operating profit uh, and free cash flow. And then uh, you can see that we have uh, on the business group's assumptions, we have both net sales and also operating margin. And then what comes to te technologies, uh, we have also given you what is the operating profit assumption for this year. And also the seasonality, we have given you very uh, hopefully good <laughs> understanding how, how the year will play out uh, and, um, and the seasonality will be, uh, I would say, more back to normal that we've seen in some years uh, uh, ago as well and, and very heavy second half while quarter one is about 23% normally lower than, than quarter four year before. Uh, so I hope that these more detailed assumptions in the guidance will give you a better understanding how the company is, is going and, and uh, also giving you a better understanding of the different areas and businesses. Maybe as a quick follow-up just to, to put things in perspective in terms of seasonality. So when we are saying that we are returning to a more normal seasonality, uh, how was this then abnormal uh, in, in 2020? Uh, three, the, the, there were two main reasons for that. In mobile networks, there were significant deliveries in India in the first half of the year, uh, which uh, kind of distorted uh, the seasonality. And then uh, the same thing, but for a different reason in NI as well, the beginning of the year was extremely strong because there were catch-up deliveries that had to do with, uh, with the supply chain uh, shortage and the extremely high orders that operators had placed as a result of uh, increased demand as a result of COVID. So that's why both NI and MN had unusual seasonality in 2023, and, and, and both of those we expect to return back to normal in 24. Thanks, Simon. We'll take our next question from Francois Bouvigny from UBS. Francois, please go ahead. Hi, thank you very much. Um, just wanted to ask you on the hyperscale wind and momentum I mean, Pekka, you see me, you know, in your remarks and, and uh, you know, in the release, uh, quite excited about uh, the wind and the network infrastructure momentum. And, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, from the switching and routing, you know, do you, do you, are you taking some, some market share there? Can you elaborate a bit on which upper, upper scale, you know, wind momentum, you know, if it's related to AI, just to understand a bit better um, the momentum because when we look at Arista and Cisco, it doesn't seem they have a lot of momentum, so it's very specific to you, which would suggest that you are gaining some market share. But then you said a bit earlier that, uh, you know, the market share is more on the optical side and seems to be more market driven on the other side, so routing and six. So just to elaborate would be great. That's my first question. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a highly relevant question. The, the uh, NI business with uh, hyperscalers has been fairly uh, optical driven, exactly as I commented uh, before. We have existing optical business with them that is looking pretty good. But the main growth potential for us there is really in, uh, uh, in uh, data center switching. Uh, and I cannot disclose uh, the name, but, but we had uh, a significant order. Uh, from one of the hyperscalers in Q4. We hope to be able to disclose the name also in not too distant future, but we are not able to do it yet. Uh, this will be driving uh, growth for uh, for uh, web scale business in uh, in the IP networks part of uh, NI uh, going into 2024. Of course, we have to remember that compared to our competitors, our uh, switching business, data center switching business uh, is small. So we are a challenger, but the, the good side of that is, of course, is that now when we have a, an increasingly strong product portfolio for that based on our in-house uh, silicon, which is welcomed by hyperscalers, combined with strong software offering that offers a lot of flexibility for different data center architectures, we believe that there is a possibility to gradually break into uh, this market and, and, uh, uh, and uh, get uh, meaningful growth uh, in the segment because, of course, we know, we all know that the CSP market as a whole will not be a growth market. Uh, of course, we target to gain share there, but data centers will be 
the most significant growth market in the whole world in our industry, and that's why it is so important to increasingly focus on that segment. Did you have a oh, question? Uh, just uh, yeah, just a quick clarification and, and uh, on what you said, Pekka, the, the, the deal you signed and you can disclose yet. I mean, I guess it's a market share. I mean, I guess you are it's kind of a market share winner, would, I would imagine, given your low footprint in originally in this. Yes, it is, it, is a, it, it is a market share win, yes. Okay. And so my follow-up question is on Open RAN. Um, you know, AT&T uh, kind of uh, uh, surprised the market with this uh, deal. Um, and I just was wondering if you see some acceleration in terms of activity of Open One from other operators following that deal. I mean, we are a few months now, a couple of months after this announcement. From what you understand, the op other operators are also looking closely at it. And so do, do you expect other announcements from other operators this year of this kind? Or do you really think it's like just a one-off for now? Open RAN is gradually gaining gaining speed. I don't expect, and I have not seen that uh, the AT&T decision uh, would uh, have uh, led to any kind of increase in Open RAN interest in other parts uh, of the world. Um, Del Oro estimates that uh, in 2028, ORAN would uh, represent roughly uh, 25 percent uh, or 24 percent of the total uh, RAN market. So that gives you a perspective. Uh, what I really suggest is that that people need to follow up very closely that uh, that what the facts about different rollouts are, including in all announced projects. Uh, how quickly will it be, and will it be true ORAN, or will it be ORAN where you just have the same supplier on both sides uh, of the interface? Uh, we have two real commercial ORAN deployments ongoing at the moment. One is with NTT Docomo in Japan, and the other one is the recently announced uh, uh, Deutsche Telekom project uh, uh, in uh, Germany. We have uh, already connected our DU and CU to five suppliers' radio units, which is more than any other uh, supplier. So gradually, uh, ORAN front hall, open front hall interface is becoming commercial reality. Uh, it starts from simple radios and only gradually moves to massive uh, MIMO, but it will eventually get there uh, as well. So it will be part of the market, uh, a small part of the market for quite some time. But as I have said before, we see it as more as an opportunity than a threat for Nokia. Thanks, Francois. We'll take our next question from Sami Sarkimis from Danske Bank. Sami, please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the demand. For more than the effort of uh, less than 9 billion euros this year with low single digit uh, EBIT margin, just curious uh, how will you be able to regain scale and, and grow revenues to 10 billion euro targets that will be required for double digit margins uh, in the long run? I mean, if we look at uh, the, the latest forecast from uh, the likes of Del Oro, the five-year outlook uh, for RAN market looks quite uh, flattish, even if you assume some uh, shape gains uh, from Chinese rivals. Uh, do you have any, anything else planned than uh, the, the cost program that was announced after third quarter results? Of course, I mean, the cost program is an important element in this, but we also have to remember that uh, perhaps with the exception of India 2023, was uh, was a really weak year uh, when it comes to investments. And uh, when you look at the big picture, only 25% of 5G base stations are mid-band. So that is suggesting that there will have to be, over time in the second half of 2020s, there will have to be significant investments in 5G radio networks in different parts of the world already before uh, 6G starts to come in. Data traffic continues to grow 20 to 30 percent of the year, and then in addition to that, the Chinese will be increasingly under pressure because of uh, political reasons and because um, because of the various actions that uh, that uh, the Western countries have taken to limit, limit uh, their access to uh, latest uh, silicon. So it is very clear that uh, to get to 10 billion uh, top line, we have to continue to take uh, market share. AT&T is, of course, a setback. 
from there, we need to start climbing back up uh, towards a market share that uh, we'll need to start by uh, by three if you want to get to uh, 10 billion uh, top line. It is a challenge, absolutely, and that's why we we have uh, provided a, a fairly uh, fairly uh, low guidance for uh, this year's profitability, one to four percent, and then we commented 26 target uh, at the December December event. Uh, we are not assuming that we would get to double digit by 2026. Then uh, we also need to keep in mind that when we talk about the second half of, of, of the decade, uh, by then we will have significantly increased uh, the non-CFT business part of uh, mobile networks. We are already now growing, uh, albeit from a low base, uh, fast in uh, uh, private wireless. Uh, and then a very important target for the second half of the decade is, uh, uh, is the defense industry, where the spending is significant. Uh, it is currently mostly proprietary military technologies when it comes to communications, and uh, the challenge they are facing is that it is getting extremely difficult to, uh, to uh, be cost competitive there when the technologies are proprietary, so it's getting extremely expensive, and that's why the whole defense industry uh, in several parts of the world is, is looking at commercial technologies at the moment, to, uh, such as 5G, to, uh, to, uh, um, to provide an alternative to proprietary uh, military uh, technologies. We have said that the actions that MN is taking will allow them to lower the level of net sales to reach this 10% operating margin to approximately 10 billion, as you said. So that is a correct uh, figure that you mentioned. That is our target, how we are modeling the business. Currently, before the cost action started, uh, the level to reach a 10% operating margin in terms of sales was 11.5 billion euros. So now we are taking that to 10 billion uh, euros. Do you have a quick follow-up, Sam? Uh, maybe technical regarding technologies. Uh, there was a slight drop in uh, IPR run rate during Q4. Can, can you elaborate on that and, and then just update on where we will be after uh, the, the OPPO renewal? I think previously you were talking about 1.1 billion uh, starting this year, but now I guess it must be a bit more than that. Yeah, thank you, Sami. Um, yeah, what, what comes to um, run rate, in, in quarter four we had one uh, license that expired at the end of quarter three. And that's why we see um, a run rate uh, change as well. Uh, but if you look 24, so we are guiding an increase in our run rate, and um, we just cannot quantify these yet because we we have still some deals that are outstanding, and and because the content of the deals are confidential, we are not allowed to give you uh, that much information about that. But I hope that that. Uh, um, Perhaps in quarter one, we will give you more flavor of, on this as well. And, and what comes to 24 operating profit, we said at least 1.4 billion for the full year. And this is including the catch-ups as well. Thanks, Sami. We'll take our next question from Richard Kramer from Arete. Please go ahead, Richard. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, guys. Uh, Pekka, my, my question is, I'm just conscious that, you you know, this year you've laid out targets and talked about water strength at the beginning of the year and then needed to reduce your targets for margins and cash conversion. Now you're looking at a billion of cash outflows for restructuring. And so my question is, how are you going to mitigate the risk of, of losing sales or momentum or other opportunities in the midst of this reset? And are you, are you confident that you can undertake the restructuring without the opportunities that you've laid out, the green yeah, the, uh, I mean, the, the biggest restructuring when it comes to customer interface, that actually went live already already uh, on the 1st of January. So we did it very quickly. We did, made the decision late in the year, and we planned and executed everything very, very quickly. So now Q1 will be the quarter of stabilization uh, in the customer interface. And I have to say that when we have explained the logic to the customers, basically saying that we want for each business to uh, to – place highly empowered teams in front of the customer uh, so as to shorten, simplify the organization structure and shorten the distance between the customer 
and the real decision makers for each business, that has been very well received. And when you then complement that with the account executive concept where, where one of the sales leads uh, of the businesses take on as an additional responsibility to uh, run the overall relationship management with the customer and then to coordinate cross uh, BG uh, matters. So that simplification has been well received. Uh, of course, this type of things also always cause, uh, cause uh, stability issues in the short term, but uh, I believe that they will quickly be behind us and people will start to see the benefits of this new model. Then when it comes to the other cost savings, in addition to the simplification of the customer interface, there we have to look at each business separately. And of course, as we said, mobile networks accounts for roughly 60% of the action uh, we are taking. And that's, of course, a reflection of the overall industry outlook and the challenges that that business is facing. But this is already also well uh, underway in terms of implementation. And there, the most important goal is, is really, as we said in December also, is to protect our R&D output. Uh, okay, but then, thanks. Yeah, but, okay, please. Uh, yeah, if I just then, then move on to the other businesses. So, because this is very much MN-centric, then, NI has a different situation because there we have, as I said, great order intake in Q4 and we have a 2 to 8% growth outlook for this year. So there obviously the need to restructure the cost base is not the same as it is in the MN business. And then in CNS, the action is mostly centered around the portfolio rebalancing. You will have seen that we, we made some divestments mm -hmm. uh, last year and, and we are getting close to the type of portfolio that we look at look, are looking for. The rebalancing is not 100% done yet. We are still working on certain things. That's really the name of the game in CNS. And then tech we already discussed because now with the with the OPPO deal and, and hopefully the rest coming soon, we will see significant stability in that business. So all, all four businesses are in, in a fund, fundamentally different place when it comes to the restructuring need. Okay, thanks. And then one quick one from Marco. Again, just conscious that your predecessor had relied in the past on sale of receivables. You did mention that in the in the statements. Um, could you give us a sort of rough quantification of how much sales of receivables helped this uh, very good cash flow performance in Q4? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we actually have changed quite dramatically what comes to uh, how we see sale of receivables. Uh, the main thing what we do when we use sales of receivables is to mitigate risks. So it could be country risk or customer risk uh, and, and also uh, the cost, hedging cost, for example, in, in certain currencies. Um, so, so the uh, principle is quite different. Uh, and, um, and now in quarter four, we mentioned that, but it, was, it wasn't a meaningful increase. So in, in some quarters, we, we see changes in sale of receivables, and it could be, a, just like I said, that it could be a specific uh, country or customer where we see that it's good that we, we hedge ourselves by selling the receivable. Or in some cases, actually, uh, we see also that that um, uh, customers are, are uh, themselves paying for sale of receivables, uh, and then, of course, it's, it's um, a no-brainer to do that. Thanks, Richard. We'll take our next question from Daniel Gerberg from Handelsbanken. Daniel, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, and good day, gentlemen, and uh, congratulations, solid year, and, and uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I would like to ask you a little bit uh, on uh, coming back to, to the uh, catch-up uh, and the IPR revenues uh, that you see. And, th and the question is really, if uh, the uh, 1.4 billion low level you, that you aim for in technologies in 2024, if this is dependent also on that you signed the recently expired name, and if it also includes uh, HP and Amazon that you have litigation for, or if you can more or less meet this 1.4 billion also out, excluding these three. Yeah, what comes to different deals and, and uh, exactly they, uh, their levels, we cannot go into, as, as you understand, these are confidential. But we, we have guided 
on the best knowledge that we have today and what we see will happen throughout the year. And, and we've been clear on that as well, that this is including the catch-up for those um, uh, OPPO uh, deal that we just signed. And, and um, we also expect to sign a couple other deals um, in, in, uh, in technologies uh, that we have uh, that has expired uh, before the year end. Perfect. And, and a follow-up, if I may, on uh, the broadband equity and access deployment program in the, the U.S. Have you seen any news there in terms of uh, financing, any early order intake? So if it's still your view that it will be supportive on the second half of, of this year? Thanks. Well, absolutely, it will be It will be supportive. And uh, exactly as we said earlier, the impact starts to be when we talk about sales it starts to gradually come in in the second half uh, of the year. We have a lot of stuff in the uh, in the pipeline that we are working on at the moment. Uh, so second half of 24 and then of course 25, uh, it will play a meaningful role in uh, in NI, uh, especially fixed networks, but uh, there could also be benefits to IP networks and uh, optical networks. Uh, of course, we need to keep in mind that when we talk about the 42 billion total program value, uh, approximately 10% of that is addressable to us. The rest will go to something else like digging cables into the ground. Thanks, Daniel. We'll take our next question from Joseph Sue from Barclays. Joseph, please go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my questions, uh, one and, uh, and another follow-up. So, firstly, uh, on your free cash flow conversion guidance for 2024, it, it remains well below the long-term target, uh, despite the boost from the IPR cash flow payments. I understand you, you talked about the, the moving parts with restructuring and also some prepaid payments already happened. And that, are there any reasons for us not to expect a bigger working capital reversal given the 5G cycle? And uh, just wondering, what are we we're missing here? Yeah, uh, just like you mentioned as well, that we, we will have the negative impact by the prepayments that we received in technologies in 23. And, um, and then we expect also working capital to continue to have a positive impact. Uh, but these, if you sum, sum up these, we believe that we, we are well in the range that we have guided, which is improving from last year. Last year range that we guided was 20 to 50 percent. Now it's 30 to 60 percent, and then year after that we believe that we are well uh, in our long-term uh, guidance range as well. So it's step-by-step -step improvement that we see in, in the free cash flow conversion ratios. And when it comes to comes to uh, networking capital, uh, we already saw good release in Q4 last year, which was one of the drivers behind the strong cash flow in Q4. There is still additional potential there, but I'm just kind of saying that part of it was already released in, in Q4. Then there is the 700 million prepayments in tech, uh, or, or 700 million, no, sorry, I take it back, 700 million lower uh, cash compared to sale, uh, the net sales in 24 in tech. Then there is restructuring cash outflow in 2024. And then since you mentioned the catch-up payments, there you have to remember that uh, that will be both cash and uh, revenue in 24. So that does not improve the conversion. It improves the absolute cash, absolutely, but it does not improve the conversion. Oh, thank you. And, and then just a follow-up on, on the uh, bid project in North America. And, and uh, just wondering how much contribution have you uh, uh, based into your 2 to 8 percent NI growth uh, from these uh, bid projects uh, in North America? And also, you, you, you talked about uh, better orders you're seeing for these projects. Uh, and what's your visibility to the timing of these uh, projects in terms of the delivery? Yeah, well, uh, as I said, uh, the timing is such that, that we start to see top line effects of it in the second half of uh, uh, gradually in the second half of 2024 and then then into 2025 we have a strong pipeline uh, of opportunities uh, if I'm not mistaken there was something small in the order intake already in Q4 but that was small uh, so it is taking off gradually these things because they are politically driven they always take uh, take time first you allocate the money on the federal level then it goes to the state levels 
and then gradually fluctuates the different opportunity opportunities with uh, with carriers. Uh, we have not quantified uh, exactly uh, how much of this would be in the uh, two to eight percent growth assumption uh, in uh, NI, but uh, as I said, it's H2 driven and uh, and it's not huge yet in 2024. It will grow gradually throughout the second half and then then uh, then then into 25. Thanks, Joseph. We'll take our next question from Artem Paletsky from SEB. Artem, please go ahead. Uh, yes, hello, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, I would li like to actually ask on uh, European development and uh, looking at revenue trends. So, so it seems to be the case that the declines have been accelerating, also excluding uh, technologies-related impact in Q4. Uh, could you maybe talk a bit more uh, what is uh, happening really there? Is, is there also potentially some inventory digestion which is uh, ongoing on the market? I mean, there, there, I mean, here and there, there could be some inventory digestion, but the real issue in, in Europe is really the weak economy, uh, operators, high leverage, high interest rates, uh, and uh, consequently, their uh, low appetite uh, uh, to invest. Uh, the big question is that when will that start to change? Of course, lower interest rates would be great uh, to that end, but uh, fundamentally, uh, I believe that they will have to start investing again. And, of course, they are talking about it, but we have not seen that much uh, yet. What I'm afraid, and this is my big big worry, I mean, not that much about Nokia, but as a European, uh, there is a risk that uh, Europe falls behind the rest of the world in terms of competitiveness because of the quality of digital infrastructure that we uh, have. Uh, the, the 5G deployment is slower in Europe than in other parts of the world. Uh, politicians and operators understand it. They are talking about it. Uh, it remains to be seen when that will start to change. But uh, I'm convinced that it will change. But uh, these things like uh, mid-band penetration in uh, 5G radio, etc., it is clearly lower in Europe than in many other parts, uh, parts of the world. But again, uh, what we would hope to, of course, see that uh, that uh, the operator market in Europe would uh, consolidate, so that uh, we would get uh, stronger, financially stronger operators. In Europe, there is one operator per four to five million uh, inhabitants, uh, and that that is, of course, a totally different level than in any any other part of the world. In India, there's there is uh, there is. Uh, uh, depending on how you calculate uh, three or four operators uh, uh, per 1.3 billion people. In China, there is uh, three operators for 1.3 billion people. And in Europe, we have one operator for four and a half million people. So the market is so fragmented that it does need to get consolidated. That's one aspect um, of the picture. But then there are others, as I said, interest rates, etc. you have a more uh, yes, I, uh, the follow-up would be actually relating on some good strides what you are making uh, on switching side. And, and could you maybe comment uh, on profitability of this business, how we should think about it? Is it uh, more like IP networks uh, type of margin what you are making, sir? Well, that is, of course, highly confidential when we get to one product group for one customer uh, group. But, of course, all this has been assumed in the uh, targets that we have, uh, both uh, short-term and long-term targets that we have uh, put ourselves for uh, for the NI uh, business. IP business has good profitability, and uh, and uh, uh, the targets uh, that we have uh, for that business will, of course, stay there, also including the growth uh, in, uh, in switching. Thanks, Arthur. We'll take our last question from Alexander Paterk from Societe Generale. Um, Alex, please go ahead, and if you don't mind keeping it to one question, just give me the time. Yes, thank you. Um, just, just a quick one to, to come back on uh, uh, mobile networks very briefly. Um, could you give us a broad idea of when you expect mobile networks to, to kind of bottom out and flatten? Is that a 2025 event, or will it happen later? Maybe another way of asking this is, you know, at what point do you expect the AT&T uh, 5G footprint loss uh, resulting from last year's decision to wash out of the base? I know you gave some color on, on, on AT&T and all the puts and takes, but um, just to give us a broad idea there. Thank you. 
The, I mean, I understand the question very well, but uh, but you will appreciate that it's extremely difficult to answer because, as I said, first of all, we cannot comment the AT&T situation before we have concluded the negotiations. That is one thing. Uh, and, of course, we, we expect to continue one way or another at least to continue to be a supplier there as well. Uh, then there is the whole Indian question. Volumes are right now going down. What will happen in India? Which operators will invest and uh, and how much and when? Uh, how will the um, 4G refarming take place in India, et cetera, et cetera? And then there is this whole question of when will the data traffic will grow to a, a level where operators throughout the world, including in Europe, will be forced uh, to invest. So it is simply too early to say that 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 when mobile networks would have reached uh, the bottom. Our outlook for this year, we have wanted to be realistic. That's why we are saying one to four percent uh, uh, comparable operating uh, margin. But we are sticking to our longer-term ambition to reach this. What uh, Sami also referred to in his question that with 10 billion sales, we target 10% uh, um, uh, operating margin. That's how we are modeling the business, but that does require that we also penetrate, penetrate into non-CSP segments in the second half of 2020s. Thanks, Alex, and thank you everyone for joining us today. This concludes the Q&A section and today's call. I would like to remind you that during the call today, we have made a number of forward-looking statements that involve risks and uncertainties. Actual results may therefore differ materially from the results currently expected. Factors that could cause such differences can be both external as well as internal operating factors. We have identified such risks in the risk factor section of our annual report on Form 20F, which is available on our Investor Relations website. Thank you for joining us. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect. Oh.